Okay, good morning, Boker Tov. I want to thank our sponsors of our shear for uh, this year, the series for this year, Dr. Zavi and Bella Morgan, Lezecha Nishmas, Liloy Nishmas, our dear friend Rabbi Dr. Brian Galbit, Rabbi Tzvi Ben Ruven Nassan. A reminder, there still is the opportunity to sponsor each individual shear each week, so it would be uh, lovely if anybody would like to, in honor and memory, simply let the uh, office know, and we would appreciate your sponsorship. We continue Rav Volbez Sefer, that a righteous person lives with emuna. You're only alive if you're living with emuna. Tzadik be'emunah so yechia, tzvi. And Revolbe, basically, that name itself, which is not his, Tzadik be'emunah so yechia, is a pasuk, is uh, the idea that we're made up of two parts. On the one hand, we have a neshama, we are a soul. Not we have a soul, we are a soul, and we have a body. People mistakenly think, I'm a body, and I have a soul. Who am I? The person I see in the mirror person who enjoys that hot cup of coffee on a beautiful, chilly, boca fall morning. I am that body. I'm a body that, in, that I indulge in, that I pamper. I'm a body that I dress in stylish clothing. I'm a body that I take care of and draw pleasure from. I'm a body and oh yeah, I have a soul. That's what I heard in Shua once. I have a soul. But it's really the opposite. We are a soul. That's who I am. That's everything about me. I am a soul. After 120 years, when our body will return to the earth from which it came, when it will become, become, you'll excuse me for the graphic description, when we will become worm food and disintegrate and dissolve and disappear, let's hope we're not a body, but rather we are a soul. Our soul is timeless, it is immortal, it is eternal, it lives forever. We are a soul and we happen to have a body. That's what I once heard in Shul. And so I have to feed my body and I have to take care of my body and my body's even allowed to be pampered and it's even allowed to enjoy the pleasures of this world as it positively affects the soul. But I am a soul and I have a body. I'm a guf and I'm a shama. I'm a living in two worlds simultaneously. And the question is, really, every yid, every Jew, every human being wakes up every morning and has to ask themselves, which is my primary world and which is my secondary world? Which really defines me and which is just tangential to who I am? Am I a body? Is my whole life devoted and dedicated to the pleasures and the advancement of my body? And occasionally I do something to nourish my soul when I remember I have a soul. Or am I really a soul? Am I in a shama on fire? My soul is connecting with the souls of other people and my soul is connecting to the source of all souls, to our God, to Hashem Yisbarach. And am I nourishing my soul? And am I pampering and caring for my soul? And oh yeah, I have a body, so I... I can't neglect it either because the soul needs the body to operate in this world. Which defines me? Who am I? Which is my life all about? Both of them produce noise. Both produce a voice. I heard this uh, described very beautifully yesterday from a, a new friend that I met, Rabbi Yossi Zakatinsky. He described, both my soul and my body produce a sound, a voice, a call. My soul is screaming out for what it needs and my body is screaming out for what it needs. But, you know, when, when, if the volume of both are up, you can't hear anything. The Gemara says, two voices you can't hear, you can't discern. If the two people speaking, speaking at the same time, you can't hear anything. If you have the volume up on two things, you have, you have static. So which one is the volume up and which one is the volume down? My guf or my neshama. So it's to really be alive, the volume of my soul has to be up. Am I living in the world of Amuna? Am I living in a world with Hashem? Or am I living with a world where I talk about Hashem? Am I in a relationship, or am I just talking? Or am I just talking about it? So uh, we are on page. I think we're on the bottom of page pay base. I think we're on the bottom of page pay base. So again, to give you the background of what we're up to and what we've been studying, Rav Chaim Vital, the great Kabbalist, the student of the Arizal, tells us that there are four elements within man. It's not his. This doesn't come from him. It comes from earlier. But the idea that we're made up of uh, air, water, earth, and Fire, wind, earth, water, and fire. Each of these elements within us, the balance between these elements and the health and functionality of each of these elements determine who we are and how we operate in the world. And so when I look at a bad quality or a bad habit or a bad trait, my goal is not to break that habit. As the Kutzker Rebbe said, if I break a habit, I have two bad habits. So my goal is not to break the habit and create two bad habits. My goal is to understand where is that symptom coming from person presents with a rash on their skin, they go to the doctor. So if the rash of the skin is simply a rash, you know, you touched a leaf that you shouldn't have touched, so then fine, put a little cortisone cream on it. Fine, you're gonna be fine. But if the rash is indicative that there's something else going on inside, you could treat the rash from today until tomorrow, 
But there's something that's producing that rash. There's an illness. There's a virus in the system that's producing that rash. So what Rav Chaim Vital was saying is, when you act with arrogance or anger, when you're filled with envy, or we're going through all these character traits, that's a rash. So you can keep treating the rash, but if you don't solve and you don't heal the virus, the illness, the rash is going to keep coming back. And the rash presented itself first on your face. So you healed it on your face. Now it's going to present itself on your back. Then it's going to present itself on its arm. But until you get to the core of the virus, the rash is just going to keep coming back and presenting itself. So people who live with envy, people who explode in anger, people who live and struggle with arrogance, all these qualities are just, the, it's whack-a-mole. You know what whack-a-mole is? Yeah. So it's a game of whack-a-mole. You knock it down here and it pops up over there. And unless you get to the core, then you're not going to heal it. And of course, why are we studying this? Because what is the core? Amuna. If you're living a selfish, self-centered, narcissistic life, if you think you're in charge, you're in control, if you take responsibility both for the good and you beat yourself up over the bad, if you live with anxiety and envy and arrogance and anger, it's because you think you're in control and you think life and the, is all about you. And the moment that you let go and let God, the moment that you see Hashem and you feel Hashem, the moment that you recognize that there's a plan for everything is the moment that you can let go of all those other, the rash goes away. The rash goes away. The virus is that you're living with Anochi, I. Life is all about me. That's the virus. If you heal the virus and you get rid of that Anochi, the Anochi HaOmeid Beini Uveinechem, Ben Hashem Uveinechem, if we can get rid of the Anochi that stands between God and us, the sense of I, the ego, and we can instead replace it with the Anochi of Anochi Hashem Alokech, the Anochi that there is a God, He created the world, He loves us, He's our Father, He's our King, and He's involved in our lives, and He knows about our lives, and He loves us, and He wants to feel our love. I wrote an article a few weeks ago, I don't even remember, where I talked about Hashem loving us and our loving Him, and it's not right that other religions took that from us, that's our bumper sticker, that Hashem loves us, and He, and, and he, and he wants us to love Him, and I don't know who this person is, somebody wrote an article about me and about that article, I saw it yesterday on Times of Israel, they claim like that's a far notion, God's perfect, He doesn't need our love, how could you talk about our needing to love God? And like for a minute I was like, oh my goodness, did I say something? And then I realized, I say three times a day, yeah. we actually have a mitzvah, entire mitzvah is to love Hashem. So to say, does God need our love? God doesn't need anything, He's omnipotent, He's infinite, and He's perfect. But He did command us to love Him, He wants us to love Him, and He loves us, and that's the relationship that we share. That's the relationship that we share. So we have this rash. People are walking around with all kinds of rashes, spiritual rashes. There's a spiritual rash of arrogance, a spiritual rash of envy, a spiritual rash of anxiety. There's a spiritual rash of worry and fear. There's all kinds of people walking around with covered in rashes. And the answer is not costco size cortisone cream. <laughs> the answer is to heal the illness. And the illness and the virus is stop, stop focusing on ourselves and start realizing that there's someone greater, there's someone bigger, that there's a master plan, that there is a reason, there's a cause, that everything is happening for a reason. Everything is happening for a reason. So uh, we're on the bottom of page, page base. I'll tell you, my, um, one of our daughters, our 12th grader, is in Israel right now. Her class, her 12th grader, Hadar, is there for a class trip. So they got to Israel, and the Goldbergs have had a bad streak in 2019 with suitcases. This might be the fourth time that we've traveled this year and the suitcase gets lost. I'm sharing that with you for two reasons. So you'd say, oh, but I'm sharing it with you for two reasons. One is, because I can't emphasize this enough, it occurred to me, not even this time, the last time in the summer, when members of the family lost their suitcases. When you travel somewhere, and you get to the conveyor belt and your suitcase is there, that's a miracle. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. In other words, like all of life, there's so many things that we just expect, we're entitled to. What do you mean? I paid for the suitcase, they tagged the suitcase, you took the suitcase, it should be there. Not only should it be there, it should be the first one off the conveyor belt. <laughs> and it should not be damaged, and it should not be wet, and it should not be, right? That's our attitude, that's our mentality. But if you think about it, it is a miracle. I drove up over here, far away, and I handed you my bag, and somehow my bag got from you, to where the plane is, up in the belly of the plane, flew with us, it came out, the guy who threw it didn't knock off the wheel or the handle or the whatever, it made it from there, through the truck and the conveyor belt and the, set and the terminal and three, I don't know, you ever fly in Atlanta? It's like half a day to get from where you land to where the baggage comes. It's a different time zone. 
It's two different time zones, where you landed yeah. and where your bag comes. Yeah. But somehow the bag gets from there to where you are. You need a nap by the time you get to the baggage claim. And you bag out. And, and here's the biggest chiddush. I, this is one of the anomalies, the wonders of the world to me. You know how easy it is to drive up two people, drive up in front of an airport, one runs in, takes off five suitcases, goes in the back of the car, pulls up. There's nothing stopping anyone from taking your suitcase. Nothing. No one's checking the bag tags to make sure they match. There's no security, no one's checking out. There is nothing. My point is this. When a bag is waiting for you that you checked in, you have to stop and say, thank you, Rebun Shalom. That was a miracle. It is an absolute miracle. So instead of the default being the bag should be waiting, the default is I probably don't have my bag. Right, we've now learned, pack a few essentials in your carry-on. You learn that the hard way. And, uh, and it's a miracle if the bag's there. So we've got to stop and pause and see the miracles in our life and say, thank you, Hashem. Hashem, why did my bag make it and the other one didn't? Why did the other one make it and mine didn't? It's all from you. There's a master plan. So why am I telling you this? Because Baruch Hashem, sometimes you get the greatest nachas when things seep through. So the person running the trip texted us that when our daughter found out her bag wasn't there, and there was a whole thing about how her bag got tagged and who, who she put it through with. Our daughter said, obviously Hashem meant for me not to have my bag. Wow. Baruch Hashem. Baruch, I don't know that I would have reacted that right, way right away. Anyway, it's now uh, three days later. We got word they found her bag. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. So my point is the things that we take for granted, it's another example. Every day you see another example. Are we living with a mindfulness, a consciousness, a tzaddik be'emunas, a yichya? Are we living with that sense that even the small things I have to express my gratitude for who says that I'm entitled to my bag and that person lost it? Maybe I should, why did I lose it this time, not last time? There's always a reason. This summer, Taco, when we lost one of our bags, we flew to New York, it was our whole family, we had a ton of suitcases. Our p family picked us up and we packed the car, we laid, all the ba seven bags made it, one didn't. They said, oh, you checked your bag too late. I said, that's funny, all eight bags were checked at the exact same moment. So seven of them were on time and then like what? It's like chatzos, like we, chatzos, like we missed the time to check it, that millisecond, the eighth bag. It's like the shkia, we missed the shkia, so like what's pshat? So anyway, the eighth bag didn't make it, but then we packed the cars and it turned out there wasn't room for an eighth suitcase. <laughs> so it's from Hashem. A couple hours later, they delivered it. Nice. So you could look at it as, I what was me, my suitcase didn't make it, or you could say, Hashem, you're amazing. I didn't have room for it. I didn't have to schlep another bag. They delivered it. I had it when I needed it. Everything's from Hashem. Okay, bottom on page, pay base. Mikom okam, we're on Midas HaTaiva. So if you remember from last time, Revolb has been telling us that an emphasis, remember we talked about there's two volumes. You could turn up the volume of the soul or you could turn up the volume of the body. But if both volumes are up, you're going to have static, you're going to have noise. Which is the volume that's playing in our lives? What's the music that I remember the Baal we talked about two times ago? Are we dancing to the music of Amuna? If you look into a room and people are dancing, but you're deaf or you don't hear the music, they're all wearing headphones, they look like whack jobs. They look like wackadoodles. But the truth is you're the whack job. You just don't hear the music. What they're doing is totally normal. So Amuna's music, are we dancing to the dance of Amuna? Are we dancing to the sounds of Amuna in our lives? Do we hear it? So Revolba said that spiritual maladies and illnesses, spiritual viruses and rashes, they can be healed with an emphasis on Amuna. So you can overcome envy and you can overcome arrogance when you realize it's all from Hashem. What am I jealous of my next door neighbor? I have what I need and I have what's meant to be for me. And why am I so arrogant? I think I'm in charge, I'm in control. No, the Ribbon Shalom. The master of the universe, he runs the world. But what about Taivas Ochel? When you're hungry for food, when you want food, and if you're a foodie, if you're not a foodie, okay. But if you love food, you love the taste of food, the texture of food, the smell of food. You love the different foods, the variety of food. You love food. You love chewing. You love swat. You love food. You love food. You love food. I'm a member, I'm a member of that club. So you love food. So that Taivas of Ochel, you can't say, well, if only I'd focus, there's Hashem. What in the world does Hashem have to do with General Ta'ash chicken? What does Hashem have to do with the sushi? What does Hashem have to do with whatever you like? What, what does Hashem have to do with that? How does working on my amuna take care of my eating habits, my fitness lifestyle? So Revolba conceded it doesn't because my maladies of how I operate, my giving into my temptations and desires in the physical world can't be solved with amuna. But here's how it does work. Because when I turn up the volume of my soul, then the volume of my body is down. It doesn't, it works indirectly. It's not as direct as it is to heal arrogance or envy, but indirectly, the more I turn up the volume of Amuna, the more I'm dancing to the dance of Amuna, the food becomes incidental. The food becomes incidental. The food becomes incidental. It's supposed to anyway. The food becomes incidental. No, if, if the food is not incidental, 
if the food is not incidental, then you have to ask whether the volume is really up on your soul or on your body. What role food has in your life? I was in New York the last couple of days for an amazing uh, two-day small group of rabbis got together to turn up the volume on our souls. That's why we got together with, with really uh, one of the great um, sound people of our generation, Rav Weinberger, Rav Moshe Weinberger. It was amazing. It was amazing. And we met with one of his Rebbeim, Rav Matl, who's a, who's, a, who's a Rebbe, and he spoke about in passing, he spoke about in passing, he said, uh, if you really, with real Hasidim, if you're really holding in what he calls Panimia Satora, if the volume of the soul is really high, you never talk about food. He said, this was his language, by us, food is never a discussion. You don't talk about it. So, in other words, there, there's an avoda of achila. You work in a way that you enjoy the food and you transform into a spiritual experience and the food is, is giving you the energy to be able to live. But it's not a discussion point. It's just like something you have to do because you have to nourish your, your body, but it's never a discussion. When it becomes a topic of discussion, so then the volume of your body may be up too high. It may be up too high. It's a very high level. I'm not suggesting that we're all there. Anyway, There is a way that through Amuna we can overcome these temptations. You can overcome these temptations, <coughs> the physical, the physical temptations. <laughs> the life of a person who lives with faith is a more spiritual life. <laughs> and the more that the spiritual world for you is a reality. In other words, if you are a body and you have a soul, you're going to fress like a person who has a body. And you're going to forget to nourish and eat. You're going to forget to imbibe spiritual food. But if you are a soul and you have a body, you say, all I care about is nourishing my soul. My soul has to eat. Oh yeah, once in a while I have to feed my body. There's a higher level. There's a higher level. It's not just that I am not drawn to and I'm not tempted by those things which harm my body. Because if I am a soul and I have a body... And the whole purpose of the body is to be an instrument and a vehicle for me to express my soul. So I need that body to be as healthy as possible. That's the whole purpose of the body. The whole reason for the body. Right? My car, I don't, some people do, but you shouldn't worship your car. The car is just how I get from A to B. The car is an instrument, it's a, literally a vehicle about how I accomplish what I need to accomplish. How I get where I need to go. So what, I'm not going to do the oil change? I'm not going to put gas in? I'm not going to take good care of it. Many people do, but if you neglect the car, then you're just hurting you, right? I am in the car. I, I, the real I is me. The car is not me. Some people mistakenly think that they are the brand of their car. That's a terrible illness. If you think your self-worth and your identity and who you are, your status is whatever... Uh, what's the thing that's called in the front of the car? Emblem. Emblem. There's a name, the thing, that logo, whatever that thing that sticks in the front of the car. If that's who you are, that's your identity, that's your status, that is how you define yourself, then, then you, got, you got a bad rash. You have a very bad spiritual rash. So now that's foolish. Now it could be that I say while I'm going from point A to point B, I like to do it with seats that can warm me, cool me, give me a massage. I like to do it with Bluetooth. I could talk hands-free. I like to do it with all okay, kinds. It drives for me. I can summon it. It's got special mirrors and lane changes. It could be that while I'm getting from point A to point B, the more gadgets and the more features it has, the better my experience of getting from point A to point B. But when I get to point B and I get out of my car, I don't take my car with me. It's not who I am. Who I am is me. It was just an instrument, a vehicle, to get me from point A to point B. And if I start to define me and I forget there's a me independent of it, then I'm, then I'm sick, then I'm ill. So therefore I care for it because its whole purpose, its whole functionality, its function, its usage is to get me from point A to point B. But if I don't rotate the tires and I don't change the oil and I don't whatever else you're supposed to do to the car, then it's going to malfunction. And then its whole purpose was to get me from A to B. If it can't get me from A to B, I don't care how many bells and whistles and features it has. So what, while it's broken down in the parking lot, I'll get a massage? It'll heat me on a cool day, but that's a very expensive massage. <coughs> that's a very expensive fan. So the whole point is to get me to point A to B. So the body's the same way. 
What I am inside the car is what the soul is inside the body. The body just gets me from point A to point B. And the more bells and whistles and the more features and efficiency and the more productivity the body has, the more the soul can do getting from point A to point B. But never mistakenly think that your body, which is just housing your soul, is who you are. So says Revolba, if that's my mentality and that's my attitude and that's what I appreciate, that who I am is not my soul, is not my body, it's my soul. That's who I am. And just like my body goes in a car, my soul goes in a body. And they're exact parallel. It's an instrument, it's a vehicle, it takes me from point A to point B. Then I'd realize that I have to care for my body. It needs its tires rotated, it needs an oil change, it needs to be cared for. And if I overuse my car, the engine's going to be overused, it's going to overheat. It's going to destroy. And if I overuse my body, if I deprive myself of sleep or I overeat and I overuse and I burn out my body, then, then it, what, what, what good is it as a vehicle or an instrument for my soul? What good does it do for my soul if I overuse it? So Revolba points out that emuna doesn't directly impact my fitness, health, lifestyle the way it does envy or arrogance, but indirectly it's critical. It's critical. Indirectly. Speak to Rabbi Blumenthal, a rabbi at BRS West, who lost over 100 pounds in the last year, wow. is now training for a second marathon. It's unbelievable. And he'll tell you that it was Pneumia, Satora, and Hasidus. It was learning and talking about and thinking about, meditating on, reflecting on these ideas that helped him finally conquer, he says, three decades of abusing his car. Wow. And I told him he should package that, speak about it, and help us, help others with it. But that's, if that's the mentality, if we can get to that point where... You know when you, when you get to, this happens a lot in Israel, where the gas is even more confusing, about which level of gas you're supposed to put in your car. And if you put the raw gas in your car, you, you won't, it, the car's going to break down. What are the options again about the gas in the car in Israel? Whatever they are, unleaded, leaded, dioctane, whatever those things are. And if you rented a car, it's got a big sticker to make sure you put the right gas in the car. Why? Because if you put the wrong gas in the car, you're going to ruin the engine. And the car's going to break down. And we should, at every meal, look at the food options that we have and say, which is the gas that goes in the car, and which is the gas that's going to make us break down. Now, you're only going to do that when you say that my body is a car, who I really am is a soul. But if you say who I really am is this body, the body could care less about the, which gas at that moment. It wants the cheesecake. It wants the deli sandwich. It wants whatever it wants. So the higher level is even to realize that you're going to say, ah, forget the gas from my body. For, for, the, for the car. My soul's hungry. My soul's craving. My soul's parched. We're on the next page. A person who gets to that really higher level, when I get there, I'll let you know how that works. But a person who gets to the higher level is able to actually transfer or convert the physical temptation of the moment. So you look at and you want this all-you-can-eat buffet of food and you say, no, 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 no. I'm transforming that to an appetite for an all-you-can-eat buffet of, of ruchnias, a spiritual buffet. I want a spiritual buffet. I want to listen to shiurim. I want to daven. I want to say tilim. I want to do chesed. I want to be overflowing with love and kindness and volunteering and good. I want, forget the, forget, I crave. In other words, you're filling your car with gas, and all of a sudden you say, I'm glad I'm, you know, the gas tank was on empty, but while I'm filling the car with gas, I realize... I'm hungry. I need to eat. <laughs> you fill in the, the car with gas and you say, not only is the tank of the car empty, my tank is empty. It occurs to you. And then you go into the overpriced convenience store with the <laughs> gas station and, and buy some junk food, which is terrible for you and so on. So while you're filling the car, you realize I'm hungry. And the same is true with, should be true with the body. Every time that you're filling the body with, gas, with food, you say, one second, my soul is hungry. The body's just a car that's getting me from point A to point B. It's nice that my body's gas tank was empty, I'm filling it. What about my soul's gas tank? When is the last time that we asked ourselves? I went through a phase where I was asking people about this. I'm going to go back to that without trying to sound pretentious. But when is the last time that you saw your friend and said, Nu, how's your neshama? <laughs> when is the last time we asked our children, How's your neshama? Most importantly, when is the last time we looked in the mirror and asked ourselves, How's my neshama? I know my weight, that, you know, some people are obsessed with what's their weight. People know their weight. People know what size clothing fits them in that tkufa, which, which part of the closet, which, which cycle of the closet they're on right now. The fat part, the thin part, the average part, the medium part, the loose part, the comfortable part, the tight part, right? We know that we know our body, but how often do we ask ourselves, how's my neshama? 
How would you answer that? What are the measuring or the metrics to determine how the health of your neshama? What would you say? How you spend your time. Part of it is how you spend your time is, is the health of the neshama. What else? What I'm thinking. Right? How, how am I thinking? Am I filled with envy, anxiety, and arrogance? Mm-hmm. Or do I feel a calm and a tranquility and am I at peace with the people around me? Peace with nature, peace with, peach, at peace with my life, at peace with Hashem. What else? What am I listening to? What am I watching? That's good, right? What? Right. When I'm in that car or when the day is over and I have a moment to relax, what am I listening to? What do I turn to? What, what entertains me? Recreation. How do I recreate during recreation? Binge watching Netflix? Or hopping an extra sheer? Or aggravating myself with the news? Or making a phone call to somebody who may have not heard from someone in a long time? I'll tell you my biggest barometer of my soul, the biggest metric, you know, the dip that oil stick and nobody knows how to change oil anymore. But the, um, the biggest measure for me is my davening. How's my davening? If I can't connect and I'm flying through it and I'm just putting a check next to it and it's like, ah, I need it to end, then my soul is parched, it's dehydrated. And when you're davening, it's like, I can't wait. When is milk? I can't wait. I can't wait to lose myself in the next fila. I can't wait to have this rendezvous and talk to Hashem and hear Him talking to me and fill Him in on my day and be connected with Him. Hamatzias hamuchlatas hayechida hiyabori izborach. Says Rav Volba, there is only one reality in the world. We look around and we think that this world is a reality, but this world is a matrix. This world is a stage. It's a set. It's fake. The only truth, the only reality in this world, which is just a matrix, is HaKadosh Baruch We are all just extensions of Him. And therefore, if He's the only truth, if He's the only immortal, if He's the only eternal, that the value of everything should be measured by how connected it's making us to Him. Here's the measure, says Revolba. You want to check how well your neshama is doing? Ask yourself, do I live in the world of Amuna? Am I living in the world of Ruchnias? Am I living in the world of Gashmias? Which is my world? Which defines my day? Which do I have a greater appetite for? Which do I long for and yearn for? Which makes me feel more satisfied and fulfilled? What takes up my thoughts and my energy and my time and my investment? Which world am I living in? Which of the volumes are up and which of the volumes are on mute? The volume of my body or the volume of my soul? If you live with Amun, if Hashem is there, Rav Weinberger yesterday was, was talking to us, and I'm not going to try to do a poor imitation of him or how he said it. You have to hear him directly. And Mir Hashem, hopefully he's going to be coming down again this winter. But he said, you know, imagine... He has many ways of saying this. We've shared some of them in the past. But this one's new. We've never shared this one before. He says, imagine that your, your, your wife is in labor. You are in labor. You've got to give it from the man's perspective. Your wife is in labor. And you're outside the labor room. And you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. And the doctor comes down. And he says, mazel tov. And you say, oh, thank you. What is it? He says, your wife gave birth to the concept of a baby girl. <laughs> concept of a baby girl. They're just cleaning off the concept. And when you come in, you'll be able to see the concept. What's a concept? What's a concept of a baby girl? It's a baby girl that you long for, that you want. He says, we talk about the concept of God. The concept, the concept, the concept. We have Yimei Iyun and philosophical, and we compare seven machshava approaches to the concept of God. But you don't have a relationship with a concept. You don't get excited and get a mazel tov for the birth of a concept. Is Hashem an abstract? Is He a concept or is He a reality? Do we get together Wednesday mornings to talk about the concept of God? Or does he come Wednesday afternoon and Thursday and Friday and Shabbos with us wherever we go when the suitcase doesn't show up and when the flight is delayed and when the person disappoints us and when the neighbor has more than us and when we're tempted to get angry by something that we see? Is he just a concept or is he a reality? Is it relationship? Is he there? Are we living in that olam of amuna? So the more faith, the more amuna, the more awareness that we have, there is a God. There is Hashem. <coughs> And he exists, and he's aware of our lives. And we talk to him, we're in a relationship with him. I'm going to be sharing one of the things that we did in our two days with him. We spent a lot of time talking about his the, the the source of his bodhidus, the idea of spending time alone or spending time alone with Hashem and having a real conversation. And what does the agenda of a conversation with Hashem look like? So a person is living with Amuna. A person who's living with a high level of faith, 
is living and operating on another plane. They're in another reality. Have you ever been exposed to somebody truly great? Have you spent time in the presence of greatness? Could be a man or a woman. Could be a great Rav or somebody who presents themselves as a simple person. And, and you walk away and you say, you know, we're both on the same planet, but we're living in two totally different worlds. We're on the same planet. We both eat and we drink and we sleep and we eliminate the food we ate and we're, like everything going on around us is the same. In theory, we're in the same planet, but we're on to totally, they're living on another plane. They're living in another world. The consciousness, the mindfulness, the attitude, the approach, the awareness, the self-regulation, the self-awareness. It's like, you ever been around greatness? Kedusha, somebody who's holy? A great man, a great woman, a great person. A kadosh, somebody who's truly holy. Because they're living in another world. They're living with an amuna. Like, we have to keep reminding ourselves, oh yeah, there's a Hashem. Oh yeah, there's a Ribbon Shalom. Oh yeah, He cares about me. Oh yeah, I'm in a relationship. In between, we forget, we move on. But they're living with, nobody has to remind themselves if you're married and hopefully happily, oh yeah, I have a wife. In between, I forgot and so I neglected the relationship or worse, chas v'shalom, I violated the relationship because, oh yeah, I forgot that. I, I keep having to remind myself I have a wife. Nobody has to, these people of greatness, a kadosh, a person who's living in a world of amuna, doesn't have to be reminded or remind themselves, oh yeah, I'm a married person. It's their reality, it's their identity, it's who they are. As their day goes on, all they do is long for sharing with their spouse in a healthy relationship. All day you're keeping a mental list of all the things that you want to share that happened to you. I want to tell you because I want you to know what's going on in my life. I want to tell you because I want to hear your feedback or your ideas or what your thoughts are. I can't wait to hear what's going on in your life. There's a constant, constant consciousness, both in forging the identity of who I am and in also informing my day. I want to check in and how are you doing and what's going on and how did that go and I want to tell you how my thing went and I want to give you nachas of what I did or I want you to share and console me on my failure and my disappointment. But that relationship is such a core part of, of who I am that it informs and inspires, it defines, it defines my day, hopefully in a very positive way. So that's the relationship. We're married to the Rebona Shalom. There's a love affair with the Rebona Shalom. There's a romance with the Rebona Shalom. I can't wait to tell him about my day. I can't wait for him to comfort me after my disappointment or failure. I can't wait for him to share in the nachas of my success. I can't wait to check in and tell him what's going on. There's no part of my day where I forgot I'm married to him and I love him and he loves me. There's no part of my day where that happened. It's part of my identity. It's who I am. That's somebody who's living this reality whose volume's up in the ruchnias. And when the volume's up, when the emphasis is there on the ruchnias and the spirituality, then the gashmias is just a necessity. It's just there because it's the fuel you're putting in your car. That's it. You don't flavor the fuel that goes in your car. You don't have really expensive, you know, the, the fuel that goes in your car is just fuel. I just need it to make my car go. That's it. You know, when they give you all the different options when you're going to change the oil, they're trying to upsell you on that. I say, well, which one will make my car go? Because that's all I needed to do. I don't need to be the guy who paid the most for the highest level oil, for did the greatest thing that really my car deserves to be lubricated in such a geschmack way. The car deserves to experience the, the great spa of, of Jiffy Lube. I don't care. The, the, the car's not going there for a spa day. Just tell me what will make my car go from point A to point B. That's the level oil I want. My car doesn't need a spa day. It just needs to get me from point A to point B. So a person who's living that level of ruchnis realizes my body it just, I just need to get from point A to point B. That's all it needs. It doesn't need more. So just give me that level of food, that quality, that amount. I just need, to, just need the body to get me from point A to point B. Be'ezah olam nimtza adam. That's really the question for us to ask ourselves. And I would argue every single time we daven, three times a day we take those three steps forward, we should ask ourselves that question. Be'ezah olam nimtza adam. The question of how is your soul is really a question of what world are you living in? What world, are, what planet are you a citizen of? For the Rambam, you see a person is living in the world of Amuna. It's a world. It's says in the mission of Avos, Rabbi Lazar Kafar Omer, Anyone know where, where Rabbi Lazar Kafar lived? He lived up north in Israel in Sipori. How do I know that? We know that. But I saw it with my own eyes. What do I mean? If you go to Sipori, next time you go to Israel and you go to the north, you go to Tsipori, Rav Yudanasi lived in Tsipori, many of the Tanaim live there. They have a wonderful museum of the Tanaim. The rabbis of the Mishnah, not the Gemara earlier, of the Mishnah. 100, 200, 300, 400. And we have the entryway of his base medrash, Rav Lazar Kafar. We have the, the, what's it called, the lintel, whatever the, 
the thing over the doorway into his base medrash, and it says, Rav Lazar HaKafar. <coughs> the Tanaim come alive. You can go there and you could see the artifacts that we have. So Rav Lazar HaKafar, he lived in the north of Israel, and he said, I cannot have a kavan, but sinas adam in olam. These three things remove a person from the world. Jealousy, desire, insatiable appetite, and honor. These three things. What do they mean? Al-Eza Ola Madubar. What world are they removing you from? What is it talking about? We know plenty of people who seek honor, and they've got a wonderful world they're living in, where they're getting a lot of false, fake honor. We know people who are driven by envy and, and, and jealousy. They're doing okay in this world. We know people who are who are filled with appetite, taiva, insatiable appetite for indulgence, and they're still here. They're still here. So what does it mean? Mutsina Sa'adam, it removes you from the world. You know what world it takes you out of? The world of truth, the world of emuna. It drags you, it turns the volume all the way down on your soul and it puts the volume all the way up on your body. If all you care about is envy and all you care about is appetite and all you care about is honor, then the volume of your body is blasting and the volume of your soul is on mute, is all the way down. It's Mutsi and Sa'adam, it removes you. Rabbi Yonah says it removes you from the purpose of the world, of why, why the world was created. And others say, each person is a world unto themselves. That's why it says, Hamatzah nefesh achas mi Yisrael. If you save one life, it's as if you save the whole world. If you kill one life, it's as if you killed the whole world. Because we're each our own world. We live in our own world. We are our own world, each of us. So some say what it means is it removes me from the world. A world of balance and functionality and health and functional relationships. It removes me from the world, my world. I'm imbalanced, I'm dysfunctional if my whole life is defined and informed by the pursuit of honor and satisfying my appetite and feeling jealous and envious of others. I, I'm not of right mind, and that's true. We know people. Motsi and Sa'ola means they're not, they're not operating with everyone else. You know people who all they care about is their honor, their ego? All they care about is their envy and jealousy of what you have? They're not able to fargin, they can't be happy for what you have? You know people who, who are filled with their taiva? So they look like they're in the same shul, they're in the same minion, they're in the same community, they go to the same job, we're, we're all friends, we have to sit at the same Shabbos meal. But Motsina Sa'adam in Olam, they're living in a silo, they're really on their own. Everyone's just humoring them by pretending to have a relationship with them. But nobody wants to be around such a person. The person who's so filled with their honor, you know, we all know those people, right? They, they monopolize the conversation, they suck all the air out of the room, they, everything, they know better than everyone else on every subject and every topic. They have to talk about their honor, their humble brag, right? I was so honored that I was invited to go to the White House Hanukkah. I was so honored to be the featured speaker at the whatever. I'm so honored to share with you. So those people, Motsina Sa'adam and Ha'olam, they look like they're a member of the Olam, a citizen of the Olam, of the world, but they're on the fringe of the Olam because no one really wants to be with them. And the sad part is they don't even know it. They don't even realize it. They don't even realize it. It's tragic, it's sad. We should never be among those people. That's what the Mishnah is saying. Don't be that person. Don't be like that. But the Ramam is a different interpretation. That's what we're ending with. That's what Revolba says. The Ramam's shot, shot is, what does it mean? It removes you from the world. It means from the world of Amuna, from the world of Amuna, from this incredible Disney world of Amuna, from this incredible Gan Eden of Amuna, from this majestic place that we call Amuna. Now, am I suggesting that if you have Amuna, you're in Disney world, that you're in Gan Eden? There's people with Amuna fighting cancer. There's people with Amuna fighting, getting thrown out of their homes. There's people with Amuna fighting Shalom bias issues or, or children issues. There's people with Amuna whose lives, by every measure, are miserable, difficult, challenging, painful, struggle, suffering, lonely. So that's such a Disney world, that's such a Gan Eden. And the answer is, Amuna empowers, Amuna gives us the ability to navigate those challenges, to know that they're there for a reason, to believe and trust that they're not chance or random or happenstance. And what would life be like without Emunah? You're just gonna go through that because you're just data, you're a statistic, you're a victim of circumstance and randomness, and that makes it better? That makes it a Disney world or a Gan Eden? When we're living in a world of Emunah, we have the ability to overcome anything. And there's nothing worse or more final than death. I hate to be so somber. There's not, nothing worse than leaving this world. Whatever pain, whatever struggle, whatever challenge, there's nothing worse and there's nothing more permanent than death. And we have seen just this year, and we've all seen in our lifetimes, people who have faced and confronted their mortality and the absolute worst conclusion there could be, and they did it with Amuna. And by doing it with Amuna, they made the most of their last time on earth. What'd they do? Cry and misery and why me and so unfair and it's random and it's chance. 
and therefore ruin the little time that was left, or live those last moments to the fullest with the people around them and with Hashem, and in that way such an inspiration for us. <coughs> so what's the world that draws us out of? The Rambam. You know the great rationalist, the Rambam? The Rambam had some feelings and emotions too. And the Rambam says, you know what world that drags you out of? If your whole life is defined by who you're jealous of, if your whole life is defined by the pursuit of honor, if your whole life is defined by what, satis- what appetite you could satisfy, you're not living in the world of Amunah. It's not just a, a question of, of where your thoughts are or your behavior is. It's a question of who you are. A person who's a ma'amin, a person who's trusting and believing, you're living in an altogether other, you're in another world, you're in another place. Again, if you've been around such people, it's like, it's amazing. It's electric. It's electrifying to be around such people. We hope it's contagious. But you're like, I'm living in the same place, but we're living in two different worlds. We're just operating in two different worlds. Says Revolva, concluding this chapter, and we'll, we'll continue with the next next week, but he says, the more that we strengthen our amuna, may we merit to enter the true, the world of truth, and then we will be able to have the strength, the courage, the wisdom, the wherewithal to eliminate the negative qualities. But I would go, I would go a step further and say, it's not just that if you're living with Amuna, you have the strength to eliminate those bad qualities. I think that when you're living with Amuna, they are eliminated. I'll, I'll give you this last muscle. You know what, you know, do you, if you're working out, you're automatically gonna eat better. And why when you're working out do you automatically eat better? Because you're like, I worked so hard, what am I gonna waste it all on this fakakta piece of whatever? I know that the chocolate cake, 20 minutes after I eat it, it's not gonna last the pleasure. I know that. So I spent a whole hour on the treadmill. It was miserable. I hated every second of it. I schwitzed like a chayra. It was miserable. I never want to do it again. I spent an hour on the treadmill. And I know that 20 minutes after this chocolate cake, it's not a lasting pleasure. Forget about it. That chocolate cake is poison. I have no interest. I Do I need to sit and do some, some meditation and, and really strengthen myself? No, don't eat the chocolate cake. No, I'm like, I'm exercised. It's not worth it. Move on. I don't even need to think about it. So the more that you're working out, the less that you're going to be tempted to eat the wrong things. And Lahavdil, the same is true. The more that you're working out your soul, and the more that you're working out Namuna, the less you're going to be tempted by the wrong things. It's not that it'll give us the strength to overcome the wrong things. You'll be able to look at it and say, those wrong things are poison for me. They're poison for my soul. I'm in the gym. I'm in the base medrash. I'm in the shul. I'm volunteering doing chesed. I'm in the gym for my soul, working out so hard. What am I going to do? put it all back on by watching that thing I shouldn't watch, by having that conversation I shouldn't have, by doing that thing I shouldn't do, it works the very same way. The more we strengthen the Muna, Yihiratsan, may we merit to turn the volume all the way up of our souls so that our bodies will make the right decisions to be able to get us from point A to point B.